So as we continue on with unit two, the atom, we will uh, start putting the numbers, the quantum numbers together, and actually I'll expand on them just a little bit. First off, the different atomic orbitals are denoted by their letters, as we saw the S, P, D, and F. Those letters have a shape associated with it. The S orbital is a cylinder or a, a, a shape. It's not a cylinder. It's spherical. It's a spherical shape. Meaning no matter how I rotate the sphere, it always has just one orientation in space. That is why when our S value that gave us from our L value, our, make, our uh, angular mo uh, momentum number, it only had a zero. Zero only has one integer. Because S, the shape of a sphere, only has one orientation in space. That's why the S block is only two elements wide. Because each orientation in space can house or hold two electrons. Okay. Now, the P orbitals are dumbbell shaped. Again, the P has three orientations in space one in the X direction, or Y direction, and Z direction. Okay. They have three orientations in space. They call them the dumbbell shape because it looks like they are dumbbells. Now the D orbitals have a clover leaf orientation. They they're a little bit weird, especially when you get to the fifth orientation. The first couple orientations, pretty reasonable. Okay, you have kind of a yeah, four-leaf clover orientation for those first four, and then it has something weird going on in that fifth one. I normally do not show the F block or the F orbitals, because they get even more complex and weird. Okay? They would have seven orientations in space as well. If you want to know what they look like, feel free to Google them. They're out there. Okay? For the last quantum number, we will have that in the, it's kind of something that talks about the spin. So how do we know there are only two electrons in each orbital? That is based on the fact that we have the spin of them described in a magnetic field. As we can see from kind of the line series that not all electrons have the same energy. How do we explain that? Because even electrons inside those orbitals don't have the same energy. We explain that by the fact that the electrons themselves have a different spin on them, which therefore has a relationship to the energy in which that electron has or is 
denoted by. What does this mean for us, these spins? Well, it leads us to our fourth and final quantum number. The magnetic spin number. And they have a spin of what's called a plus one half or a minus or negative one half. And they spin on their axes either like the uh, Earth does or opposite of uh, the way the Earth does. And they're one half, as in because when they are together, they make it whole. They make it whole. Because one half spins the other way, the other half spins the other way. Half of the whole. Who gives us this? This is Pauli's exclusion principle, meaning that two electrons can never have the exact same energy. They're not going to have this exact same quantum number. That is, when we start kind of putting these together, they are not going to have that same number by the fact that they have different spins. Heisenberg says we don't know which spin they are, we just know that they have to have different energies. The more we know about them, the less we know about them. So they can't have an identical set of quantum numbers. So when we look at it, for something that, say, has an n value of 2, and I'm using that, the L values would be 0 or 1, meaning something in row 2 has L values of 0 and 1. meaning they, have, they are occupied by the S or P block. Oh, if we look on our periodic tables, we might find that. The magnetic quantum number, the M sub L, when L equals zero, that's all you get is zero. One orientation in space. The M sub L, when L equals one, Negative 1, 0, plus 1. Three orientations in space. Each orientation can hold two electrons. If we look on our periodic tables, we will see that the P block on our periodic table is six elements wide. It is not a coincidence meaning the magnetic spin quantum numbers is going to be plus or minus one half. If we wanted to, we could sit here and write out all of the potential quantum numbers, but I am just going to use an example. And what this is, this is kind of a, a uh, kind of like your GPS coordinates. It's your energy levels. So this would be an example of something that is in the second quant as a principal quantum number of two, L value of one, M sub L of negative one, and that. Now we cannot have another plus one half. It can only have another element or another electron can only have a value of that. If it changes and has, say, a value of – 
Is that the same as that one? Your answer would have to be no, because those are two different values. Two different values, meaning two different energies. Every electron has a unique energy associated with it. These are the kind of the summarizing of Schrodinger's equations that he gave us. Kind of like, we can't identify exactly where they're at, but we're going to kind of give you a set of numbers that would give you some sort of an e coordinate system of where you might find them at. Because again, remember, it's all based on probability. Now, that brings us to the idea of electron configurations. There are some big things, and it's the periodic table that I use in the class for the classroom that has a lot of this information written out for you. Now, that does not mean that these trends are not on every single periodic table. It's just the one that I give my students is just always there. It's written out there for you. And I do that so then you don't have to frantically try and write it down at the beginning of a test and make that mistake. Or I see people with writing on a periodic table and think that they're cheating. If it's written on there for you, you don't have to worry about it. But the trends are there. The first two columns, columns one and two, have, are the S block. That's because the S orbital has one orientation. Those orientations can only have two electrons. Well, one, ele one orientation, two electrons, that's why the S block is too wide. Now, some people look at and say, well, what about that first row, hydrogen and helium? Helium's all the way over on the other side. They're raised up on our periodic table because when you have a principal quantum number of one, you only get one L value. Therefore, you only get one ML value. Both are zero. Therefore, you can only have two electrons. Columns 13 through 18 or 3A through 8A. But I prefer the IUPAC numbering system. That would be 13 through 18. That is known as the P block. The P block is six wide. The P orbitals had three orientations in space. Each orientation can hold two electrons. Three times two is six. Columns three through twelve. Or is known as the transition elements or the transition metals. I prefer the nomenclature transition metals because well, most of them have metal tendencies. They are known as the D block. The D orbitals had five orientations in space. Each orientation allows for two electrons, plus one half or negative one half. Five times two is ten. The, the uh, transition metals is ten elements wide. On most periodic tables, the lower two rows, the lanthanoid and actinoid series, 
Some periodic tables say lanthanide and actinide. I don't. I prefer oid ending on them. The IDE ending indicates or suggests that there would be a negative on their ions, but there's not. The F has seven orientations in space. We didn't show them in the notes, but they are there. The F block is 14 elements wide. Each orientation allows for two electrons. Now, why are they spaced out a certain way? We'll get into that. It all has to do with energy levels. Okay? It all has to do with energy levels. Why the periodic table is put together the way it is is based on the number of protons, spoiler alert, sorry, unit 2.5, and energy levels. Electron configurations are a shorthand way of kind of putting this all together. It's a way of kind of simplifying Schrodinger's equations even more.